Hello, this is Scottish Independence Podcast episode number 171. This time it's a talk and a Q&A with uh, Dr. Philippa Whitford, who's also an MP. It's a really excellent talk and I've also included the Q&A section because I feel that many of the people in the audience asked exactly the sort of questions that the people listening to this podcast would have asked themselves had they been there. With the q and it's quite a long episode, but I edited out a couple of bits just here and there where they're passing around microphones and so on. However, before we get to the main course of the episode, I'd just like to give you this as a little starter. This was how I was reacting internally when listening to the introduction of a programme on BBC Radio 4 recently. A region that many insist is a nation with its own language, culture and identity longs to govern itself. Is he just calling us a region? rebelling against the larger kingdom, of which it's a reluctant part. Well, that's weird. I've never heard them admit that before. The authorities in the distant capital come down hard, seeking to crush this independence movement using brute force. It's weird hearing them talk like this, but if he's saying brute force, he can't be mean in 2014, so what's he talking about? The time the Union was signed? 1715? 1745? James Conley? 1820? What's he on about? That's been the story in Catalonia this autumn, following October's referendum and the subsequent clampdown by Madrid. Ah, it was about Catalonia. I knew they would never talk that way about Scotland. But it's a story that's played out in our own country too, nearly four centuries ago. Hang on. Which is why we've come to Cornwall. 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 All right, fine. Right, enough of that nonsense, let's get on to the show. Obviously this was recorded in a public meeting, and one of the problems you get with that is, you know, someone's not got the mic on, or someone's not coming through very well, but I've been through it all, and I've tidied it all up, and you can hear every word that was said. However, obviously the volume's a little bit up and down on it, even though I've done equalisation and all the rest of it. Anyway, it's really very interesting. Hope you enjoy it, and I'll have a wee word with you at the end. But I'm also a retired doctor, worked in the Western for many years, ran the ICU for uh, most of that. And so I'm also kind of interested in what our speaker is going to say uh, tonight. Anyway, our speaker, uh, Philippa Whitford, many of you may have seen on anything from Question Time to other political programmes, is a consultant breast surgeon at Kilmarnock, at Crosshouse Hospital Kilmarnock, She's MP for Central Ayrshire, isn't it, uh, in 2015, and uh, she survived the minor cull of SNP MPs in 2017, and so is still uh, the MP for Central Ayrshire. When she speaks, she'll pick out the fact that uh, she's not originally from Scotland, from Northern Ireland, but has been here since childhood, went to Glasgow University, and did medicine there, and then, against the odds at the time, probably, managed to ascend the surgical ladder uh, to become a consultant surgeon, uh, which, uh, you know, a few years ago wasn't as easy as it is now. She'd been involved in guidelines and protocols for for, uh, breast cancer management within Scotland, also worked overseas in Gaza and, and Palestine. And, in fact, I think you were there this Easter as well. Uh, just week before last. Oh, is it just <laughs> as, as recently as that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, uh, Philippa joined the SNP, in fact, in 2012 and was involved in the independence referendum in 2014. And I think it, it was when she emphasise the risks to the NHS of voting no in the referendum. And uh, I think these risks to the Scottish NHS uh, are amplified a thousandfold uh, with Brexit, and that's what's going to be the subject of our talk tonight. Philippa. Thanks very much, Ian. I'm going to apologise in advance because I'm a terrible hand waver. So if you can only... 
hear every other word, I apologise. So I'm going to hold it in my left hand so I can still wave my right hand about and we'll see how we get on. Um, thanks very much for inviting me. And what's been nice is I'm staying with Michelle Thompson, who obviously was my colleague. And as she said when we came in, we have been violently agreeing with each other on politics for the last hour and a half and are likely to continue to do so probably till well after midnight, I would imagine. Now, obviously, I became active in 2014. And I became active because a leaflet came out in January 14 saying that if we voted yes and left the UK, we would leave the UK NHS and Scotland would have no NHS at all. And I just laughed and threw it in the bin. But when I went to work in the hospital, I realised that there were nurses who were saying, I'd love Scotland to be independent. But in actual fact, I have to vote no, because I have to vote no for the NHS. And that just did my dinger. So it's their own fault that I got up on my hind legs and started touring around. And my hubby, who's parked at the back, and I did 5,500 miles in 2014 all over Scotland, and we're already doing it again. So make sure you put the car in for service in 17 days. It says it's due. Um, because we are, again, at a, at a major crossroads. And it's really important that we take the time to decide what our future is. Because we didn't vote for Brexit. Scotland voted 62% to remain. And if we had another vote here in Scotland right now, it would be even stronger. And when people talk about, oh, we should have a people's vote, we should support a people's vote, what would they put to the public? If it's the same Bloom and Hobson's choice that we're going to get as MPs, crap deal versus no deal, what's the point in putting that to the public? You might notice all the scaremongering that we've had over the summer. Now, what they're talking about, problems maybe getting food, problems getting drugs, these things are true if it's a no deal. But it's very weird for a government to be talking like that, for a government to be trying to frighten their own people. The job of a government is to pat us on the head and say, it'll all be fine. So why are they doing that? It's because they're trying to make it socially unacceptable for any MP to vote against the deal, no matter how bad the deal is. So what's the point in putting that to the public, unless there is an option to not go over the cliff? Because the problem that we have at the moment is the public are bored out of their skulls with Brexit. People see it on the news and they're turning off. And people are not recognising that it's going to apply to them. Well, I don't run a business. Or I run a business, but it's a wee business. Or I run a business and I don't import or export. So Brexit will have no impact on me. Despite the fact that all the prices we're paying for our food or what we're buying in the supermarket have already gone up since Brexit. People are thinking, it won't apply to me. And the problem is because what you're hearing on the news is only talking about customs and trade and tariffs. And people are thinking, that's what Brexit is. It's some technical thing that will happen down in Dover and it won't affect me. But it will. It's actually going to affect everybody. And that's because the EU is about so much more than trade. The EU has been about 28 countries in the end working together, muddling through, coming up with compromises as they face some of the biggest challenges we face, whether it's cybersecurity, terrorism, climate change, migration from war zones. All of those things are not things you can sort just as one country. And the problem is it's this, it's this coming out of collaboration. And the impact for us on health and on healthcare is significant. Now, the first one that you would notice is workforce. Workforce is a challenge for all four UK health services. In actual fact, the biggest challenge is in England. They have over 40,000 nurse vacancies. Over one in 10 nursing posts in England are empty. That is two and a half times our rate. And if you speak to a nurse in Scotland, they'll tell you how hard pressed they are. Imagine that being two and a half times worse and yet they're doing everything they can to drive people away and make the UK an unwelcoming place for people who come from outside. So what we have seen is we have seen a 90% drop, 90% drop in EU nurses coming to the UK, i.e. that has just dried up since the Brexit vote. 
in Scotland, even though we are trying to send out the message, you are welcome, we want you here, we value you, 14% of our EU doctors are already in the process of leaving. These are the people that look after you. This nonsense story about because of immigrants, you can't see a doctor or you can't get help. In actual fact, the people who come to settle in the UK are usually younger, fitter, they usually come here to work. So in actual fact, there was a bigger chance that the person you were queuing to see was from somewhere else. My husband's perched at the back, 32 years here, working as a GP in our system. He's German. Germany trained him. Germany put him through university. We have done nothing but gain from his expertise for 32 years. But two years on, he still doesn't know what his rights will be. Two years on, there are people who are valuable people here from Europe whose families have been refused citizenship. We've got friends, two German GPs in Ayrshire, been there well over 20 years, three kids born and grown up in Ayrshire, and they thought, let's get our citizenship for the kids. Eldest and youngest granted, middle child refused. So, of course, what are they starting to talk about? Maybe we should go back to Leipzig, where we will be safe. That is how EU nationals feel. They feel really insecure, they feel unwelcome, and they feel distressed. So even though we, hopefully, most people in Scotland are being welcoming and are being genuine, they look at Windrush, they look at how those people were treated, and they look at their kids and think, we're still not secure here. And that's why they're leaving. And the NHS does not run on buildings or hospitals. It's people that make you better. It's people who might use a machine, but the machine ain't working by itself. It's people who operate on you. It's people who care for you. And those are the people that we really need. And that's going to be the first thing that will hit most people who are using any kind of health care. And in social care, it's even more dramatic. The staff who come particularly from Eastern Europe and work in social care, looking after our grandparents or our disabled child or our auntie in a care home. And all of these services are struggling to recruit. So workforce is number one. <coughs> number two, one of the luxuries that nobody ever sang the praises of, reciprocal health care. If you've got any sense, you have a wee plastic card in your wallet, your European health insurance card, so that if you go and you get drunk in Munich at Oktoberfest and you fall down, they'll fix your leg as if you were a local citizen. That's actually amazing. That is an amazing thing, that some other country will fix you as if you were one of their own citizens. And what we also have is for our retired people who want to go and settle in the sunny bits, feeling that they've, you know, they've put their dues in in the rain hard enough for 50 years. Actually, they quite fancy a wee bit of sunshine in the south of France. But they've never lived there. They've never paid tax there. And yet through the S1 system, they can transfer their health care rights from here to France within the EU. And they get treated as if they were French. That is amazing. And these are things that nobody praised, nobody valued, nobody talked about. And yet we're going to lose them. We also, I mean, I asked Theresa May last January, January 17, about the European Medicines Agency. And by and large, in PMQ, she stood there and opened and closed her mouth like a goldfish. And that just sent an absolute shiver down my spine because I thought that means... She thinks the EU is only about trade and customs. This is clearly not on her agenda and not on her desk. Now, she's woken up to it now. It's in Checkers. Checkers is just a big cake-and-eat-it shopping list. We're leaving. We don't want anything to do with you, but we finally realised you've got all these good things and we want to keep them. And one of them is the European Medicines Agency. And the question that I asked her is how she would avoid delay in access to new drugs because new brand new drugs are launched in Europe at virtually the same time as America because it's a market of 500 million people and it goes through one licensing system the European Medicines Agency and then that drug is licensed for the whole of the EEA now what she has come up with is she wants to be an associate member sadly there is no such thing 
as an associate membership of the European Medicines Agency. And the thing is,